great and awesome God we serve. Amen, church. Welcome to Super Monday tonight. We're so glad you're here. For those of you that are joining us by live stream tonight, welcome. It is an exciting night to worship together. Would you stand to your feet all across the room tonight? We're going to continue our praise and worship. If you're watching from home, you can turn your attention to the bottom of your screen or your device. The words are coming up there. Let's praise and worship together tonight, church. Here we go. Sing with us. church and the Bible teaches us that there is such power in the name of Jesus there is no greater name that has been spoken than the sweet and powerful name of Jesus we want you to keep worshiping with us in the song Jan is going to lead us right now you may be hearing this song uh, for several times before or this may be your very first celebrate and honor the name of Jesus tonight as Jan leads us.
Sing this with me. You can be seated. Thank you so much for singing with us. No name like the name of Jesus. Amen. My heart is troubled as yours is when we hear people Mocking the name of Jesus in our day and time, I was just blown away this past week as one of the news commentators talked about my Jesus and said he failed and made mistakes. They're making mockery of him. But I want to tell you, he's still the same yesterday and forever, and he is God Almighty. They may not bow now, but one day they will. To the precious name of Jesus. We're living in crazy times. Um, never in my lifetime have I seen anything like it. And I thank you for being here tonight. You encouraged me by you being here. I know a lot of people are still afraid. But I want to tell you, I understand that to a certain extent, but I do understand that God has not given us a spirit of fear. He hasn't. And, uh, and I, know, I know God gives us brains to use, but I just think when you're in the midst of praising God, God seems to take care of us in ways that we have no other way. And I just praise God for what he's going to do here this summer through Super Mondays. And I pray that uh, God will help you 
and especially those that are watching online. I pray that uh, if you feel like you can, please come out and worship with us. But if not, worship there. Listen to what God is saying to you. And worship with us tonight as we lift up the name of Jesus. And I want you to uh, pray for our speaker tonight as he comes, Brother Jeff. And I want you to sit there and listen and just amen him. God hears. That's all that matters. And uh, he'll get the glory. He gets the glory anyway. It's not man. He gets the glory. It's God. So just give him glory for what God's going to do here tonight. He's a good, good father. And I praise him for who he is. And I hope you'll enjoy being with us tonight. I, if you haven't already, there's something wrong. Man, that worship has been awesome. That choir sounded like they were full tonight. They, they just did an excellent job. Amen. Amen. But we're grateful you're here. I pray that you'll do like me and pray that as I've prayed today, that we want to hear a word from God. I don't know about you, I'm hungry to hear a word from God. Uh, I love preaching it, but I love listening to it too, and I, I'm wanting to hear a word from God tonight. And I want to hear something that will help me and change me and make me more like Him. And I pray that that's your prayer as well. And if there's uh, time for repentance tonight, I pray that God will give you a repentant heart, that God will break your uh, heart and your spirit and wake your conscience up to any sin or disobedience that might be in your life that you need to confess before Almighty God. Because we need to, in these difficult days, we need to be on fire for God. We need to be right with God uh, because I do believe with all of my heart that uh, as uh, Jeff LeBorg says, uh, he believes Gabriel's licking his lips, getting ready to come. I do believe that. And um, I've been preaching a series on the characteristics of a godly church. And one of the first ones out of First Thessalonians chapter 5 is that we got to be watchful. Uh, we got to be watchful for the coming of the Lord Jesus because he's coming. And I thank God that I'm ready to go, but I want as many to go with me as possibly can. Amen? Uh, we're not going to be passing offering plates tonight. If you came to give to, of your tithes and offering to our church, there's going to be uh, ushers at the back when you leave tonight uh, that uh, will have a basket for our church uh, family. But the buckets are out for uh, our speaker tonight. And we want you to give and give deep and bless our speaker tonight and uh, as he comes in a few moments to preach the word of God. Next week, we're going to have Dr. Herb Revis who will be with us. I called all of our speakers and all of them are anxious and ready to come. And uh, we're excited about that. And uh, if um, I'm praying that before the, the end of it, this building be nearly full, and I, I, I believe it will be. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm being cautious, and I know that, uh, and people are cautious, and I know that, and I'm not blaming anybody for that, but I hope you can come and be with us. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, after that, we're going to sing another song, and then uh, Brother Jeff is going to come and preach the word of God. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we are grateful to be able to come into your holy presence and to praise your name and to give glory to you. For, Father, you deserve all the praise and all the glory that we can give to you. You saved us. You are in the process of sanctifying us. And one glorious day, you're going to glorify us. And we're going to be just like you. And we're so grateful for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all because of what you did on Calvary's cross in taking our sin debt and paving the way that we could have a right relationship with God the Father. And I praise you for that. No wonder we 
lift up the name of Jesus. Because there's no other name whereby given unto man whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus. And the world, Lord, they need to hear the name of Jesus. They need to hear it now more than ever before. That he is our hope. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our healer. He is our sustainer. He is the one who gives us all of our needs. And I am so grateful for that. And I pray tonight, Lord, that our hearts are filled with praise into your name. And I pray that there will be nothing in this house that would hinder you working. I pray that you would bind Satan because he has no authority in this place. He has no authority over your people. He has no authority over your creature. Lord, he has no authority whatsoever. So we ask that you would bind him. Lord, only you can do that. We can't do it, but you, you can. We can pray that you would, and we do pray that you will. And when the invitation is given, if there are those who need to make commitments to you, if they've never been saved by your grace, may they be saved tonight. If they're away from you, Lord, or wandered away, and, and they need to come back home, Lord, bring them back to you, I pray tonight. And now, Father, thank you for each one who's come, and we just honor you for their presence. Thank you for those who are watching online. I pray that you would bless them as well. And we give all the praise and the glory for all that you're going to do in the precious, most glorious name that I know. And it's the sweet, sweet name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with us again, church. The Bible says in Psalm 72, beginning in verse number 18, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that person His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, the Messiah still, and all alone. Give him praise. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Woo! Well, hallelujah. <laughs> thank you, Brother Josh and team. Pastor, thank you for the honor of um, being uh, back at um, Living Water. Now, this says I have to open this before I preach. Hi, guys. How y'all doing? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about what's up on this pulpit. It just says, uh, please open before you preach. So, um, Pastor. Oh, my. You didn't do it? Look at that. <laughs> That's, you sure you didn't do that, preacher? Let's see who we got to pray for here. Well, they didn't sign it. But whoever you are, thank you. I, I do. You obviously know me. I, I do love, um, when I'm not wearing my boots, uh, I do love to wear uh, my socks like that. So listen, before we get started, let me just have a moment of, of privilege. Number one, I never pull on this property that my heart does not pause to praise God because your facility is, is a testimony. And I can remember um, the first year that, pastor asked me to come preach I, I i mean this with deep sincerity i had adrian rogers asked me to go to bellevue i would not have been more excited than to get to come here um because you have such a powerful testimony throughout the land but i, I never cease to be amazed at what god did over there i'm high in the world i think about those days uh in fact let me just say it this way if you worshiped here in the old worship center you cannot get the COVID, okay? That, you just can't get it. Because we didn't sit next to each other, we sat on top of each other. So if you were here before this building, you're COVID immune. Because it was hot and, and we were crammed in. You couldn't shoehorn another human in that building. Uh, and then to watch God I, uh, do this and, and put this together. I, I, and then secondly, I want to just uh, say a word. Josh, can I give... Give, now I'm not going to give them to you, but will you put them over there? In my big bag, Miss Gwen made me a quilt, uh, or a shawl, made Christy a shawl, and, uh, uh, which is perfect timing. So um, I want to just say uh, also uh, uh, thank you for your prayers. Pastor, your people overwhelmed Christy and I. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, we've been, been through a season of surgery and some pretty significant health setbacks. I had to take a protracted uh, sabbatical from my pulpit uh, from December uh, on into February of this year. Um, and I, every week, without fail, there was not a week that went by that this church didn't send me a prayer card. And I encouraged my wife. It's the hardest thing I've ever been through. Um, and every week, without fail, there was a word from this church. And um, I'm overwhelmed by how uh, much you guys have encouraged us and you get to come back and be with you. And uh, Pastor, I, I uh, told Miss Gwen her timing was perfect on our, our shawls because Christy and I found out we're going to be grandparents. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be grandparents. My daughter, uh, who is a two-time cancer survivor, uh, married a lawyer. A lawyer. She only saved one I've ever personally met. <laughs> And I was there when he got saved. So, um, I told him when he came and asked for a hand, I said, son, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, we really were holding out for a doctor. It's really this whole Affordable Care Act is not working for us. This Obamacare is just not working out like we thought it was. And he looked at me dead eye and he said, preacher, I've heard you preach. You're going to need a lawyer. So, amen. All right, take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to make your way, if you would, to Matthew 24. Pastor just got all over my sermon uh, topic and title. I want to, for just a few moments this evening, I, I want to give you just a very uh, a brief, and I pray encouraging word, at least um, I think it'll encourage you. I want to talk to you tonight, um, uh, we're going to begin, we're going to launch at Matthew 24. Uh, I want to, I'm going to give you my outline very quickly. I want to talk to you tonight about signs, shouts, and summons. Signs, shouts, and summons. Now, I know you're comfortable, but if you can, no, no guilt, no condemnation, but if you can, would you rise out of reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, 
an authoritative word. Look at verse 1 of 24 of the Gospel according to Matthew. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you that not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3 is a movement of geography. He's moving off the Temple Mount. That's that, that's that gold dome building you see when you watch the news. It's not a mosque. It's, it, it, is, it is a memorial to Omar. It's, it, there is a mosque on the Temple Mount, but that, is, that dome that you see covers the very rock that Abraham offered Isaac on. Uh, you can't go in there. The last time I was allowed to go in was 2000. Um, the year 2000, you can still see the, the deep impressions in the rock bed that were left by the Ark of the Covenant when the weight of God's glory set down on that temple mount. The, the indentions are still in the rock. And the Muslims put us out. They want us to go back in there. Uh, you can go up to the temple mount. Jesus is coming off of that piece of real estate across the Kedron, verse 3. Now as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? First question. And what will be the sign of your coming? Second question. And of the end of the age? Total of three questions. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man or no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places, and these are the beginning of sorrows. Father, bless the reading of your word, the preaching of your servant, the hearing of your people. In Jesus' name, you may be seated ever so quickly. When you come to what I think is uh, absolutely without question the greatest prophetic teaching, not only in, in the Bible, but in the history of humanity, because it's our Lord teaching in his last days. He's coming to the crescendo of his ministry, and he's pulled his men into an intimate setting. And he is teaching them specifically about what is to come and unfold as the ages begin to wind down. So for just a moment, I, I want to preface my preaching by saying I, I'm, I'm, I'm not playing on anybody's emotions. I'm not trying to use the contextual or political moment or even the biological, the COVID, in order to appeal to you. I'm just simply telling you that if you cannot see that what God has been saying in His Word is coming and unfolding in front of us, then, then I, 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 I don't know what more it's going to take. When you get to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to deal with signs. And sometimes it's just not immediately obvious to us, especially those of us who have gotten in a rut of religion. We have gotten in a rhythm of just doing church and no longer operating in the Spirit or responding to the prompting of God's Holy Spirit. We, we have a place we sit. We have a place we go. We have a time we worship. But in the midst of all of it, we've lost the sense of urgency and awareness that we are living in the most incredible, unbelievable, pregnant times of prophecy unlike any other generation before. This is the generation. Behold, when you see the fig tree bud, you are that generation. In fact, if there were one predominant sign, I mean, we could go through a litany tonight to the, to the sheer, utter boredom of just keep going through them, but if there were one prevailing sign, it, it, there is without question, it's the sign of Israel. Um, for example, I'll give you just a quick example. There's 1,948 years from the first Adam to the birth of Abraham. There are 1,948 years from the coming of the second Adam, Jesus, to the reconstitution or rebirth of the nation of Israel. On May the 15th, 1948, something happened that nobody has ever seen before. They were a people scattered from their land. They were in a hundred different countries across the globe. Their language was dead. Their land was pillaged. They, they, Isabella couldn't, couldn't get rid of them. Hitler couldn't cremate them. They just kept coming back. They are a miracle people. And God hath set his affection. I have chosen Zion for my holy name. Pray for the peace of Israel. I, uh, uh, Psalm 1. 
Psalm 22, 6, I have set her in the midst of the nations. You want to know what north is to God? Look at Israel and anything north. You want to know what's south to God? Look at Israel and anything south. I have set her in the midst of the nations. It's God's timepiece. It's God's compass. She is a holy nation with an incredible covenant, and she is the tick-tock of God's prophetic clock. And on May the 15th, 1948, when she stepped back into that land and David Ben-Gurion walked down Rothschild Street, stood in that little house, rattled that gavel, and they flew the flag of the Star of David. I'm telling you, we became the generation that Isaiah said, who hath seen such a thing that a nation should be born in a day? We are that generation. And we are watching the world turn its focus to the evidence American media is not telling it because we're wrapped up in our own political world and we're not paying attention because of the COVID and all of that other stuff. But Israel is on the brink of war. They're marshalling to the north. You're watching the fulfillment of, of Ezekiel chapter 37. The, the, the bones are back. The flesh is back. But the breath has not come. And it won't until they repent and they come to Messiah. Uh, the leading teaching rabbi just released... Uh, a, what they call an all all out of, out of Israel just 48 hours ago, begging the American Jew to come home. He had a vision from whom he calls God and that Messiah was at the door and the Jew needs to leave America and get home as quickly as possible because Messiah is on the way. Every, everything is in place. Every implement has been uh, rebuilt, the candelabra, the prayer incense. We, we were touring just about a year or so ago. I always take my groups over into the Temple Institute. It's a group of Jews who believe that Messiah uh, will not come back until all of the temple implements are completed. By the way, they are, even the Ark of the Covenant. It's not in the Pope's basement. It's not in Ethiopia. They know exactly where it's at. And the oldest teaching rabbi, before he died, on, on, on uh, record, on video, said, we have seen it, we know exactly where it's at, it's in the land of Israel, and we'll not bring it out until the temple is in place and Messiah walks in the door. We were teaching over there about a year and a half ago or so, and I took the group that I had into the Temple Institute to show them all the implements that are not, not, not symbols, not signs, but the actual real thing. And I noticed that the ephod was gone, Pastor. I noticed that the ephod wasn't in the room. I, and it's a teaching point for me when I'm teaching my people because it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. It has nine precious jewels on it. It covers the heart of the high priest. And it is a picture of the fact that they won't need an ephod. They won't need a vest because when Messiah comes, the Holy Spirit will no longer require them to wait outside of a temple or a tabernacle. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us will speak to them with clarity. I said to my God, who always takes me to the Temple Institute, where is the ephod? And he laughed and he said, well, we, we, we customized it. We, we uh, elected the high priest, the Sanhedrin that was reconstituted a little over a decade ago. They've already elected the high priest. I asked about that, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you straight up, this is the truth. He lives in the old city. We walked over to where his house is, preacher, and he lives above a barbecue place. Okay, y'all get that later. You can ask preacher about Jews and barbecue. But anyway, they've elected the high priest. They have fitted it for him. I want you to listen to what he said. We believe, he said, we are so close to the coming of Yahshua Messiah that we've already fitted him for it and we told him to just take it home because Messiah is so close to coming, he won't have time to get back to the temple mound to put it on. Just take it home. Listen, I get in trouble if I take a Baptist hymnal to the house. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they just said, take the ephod to the house. Listen to me. It's, it, it's odd to me that the church is slumbering and sleeping. It's odd to me that, that we've become apathetic and can, we've lost our savor. We've put our light under a bushel. But those who are blinded have more sense. And listen to me, the one that is coming is not the Messiah. He's a false Christ. He is not the one that can atone for their sins or did atone for their sins. And they're going to be deceived with a great deception. And listen to what Jesus said. Let no man deceive you. If we had time tonight to unpack the text, we would simply find the fact that the prevailing characteristic is deception. L listen, listen, as he says to his men, 
um, in verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive. That's the second time he said it. You're going to hear wars, rumors of wars, and you'll see, don't be troubled, for these things have to come to pass. Nation will rise against nation. The word nation there is ethnos. It's, it's, it, it's not a geographical conflict. It's a racial conflict. By the way, I will just pause here and say this. There's not but one race according to God, and it's the human race. And when you get born again, beloved, there's not a racial problem in the, in the bride of Christ because red, yellow, black, and white, we were all sinners in his sight, and the blood of the Lamb cleanses us all. Ethnos against ethnos, a stirring up, a deception. Now listen to what he says. For kingdom shall rise against kingdom. That's the political component. The, the, the racial or ethical component is that nation against nation, ethnos against ethnos. Now, now Pastor, I'm going to watch you while I say this because I don't, I don't want to disrespect his pulpit, but I want to say something and I can back what I'm about to say to you. The issue in this nation today has nothing to do with the color of a man or a woman's skin. This is a political communist Marxist movement. It was birthed out of a woman who is now in Britain. Black Lives Matter is not a nonprofit. It has no interest in protecting anybody's life. It is a godless movement that wants to bring this nation down because we stand between them and Israel and the ultimate move of the Antichrist is to destroy the apple of God's eye. That is the ultimate destruction. And there's a reason that America is not mentioned in prophecy. There is a reason she is nowhere found on the pages in the last days because she is so crippled by her apathy, complacency, and depravity. And it is my ultimate conviction that her final blow that brings her to the end of who she is is called the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the signs are there. Now listen to what he says in verse 8. Now, all these things, you're going to see these things. There'll be an ethnos against ethnos. That's, that's, that's racial tension. There'll be kingdom against kingdom. That's geopolitical rumblings of war. That, that's going to happen. There's going to be pestilence. Can somebody say COVID? There's going to be, earth, I read an article a couple of weeks ago. The, the seismologists are frustrated because everywhere there's supposed to be an earthquake and they've put their equipment the, the equipment is not picking up seismic activity in, in the Madrid. It's not picking it up on the San Andreas. It's picking it up in places that there's not been traditionally any activity. <laughs> All you got to do is pick the book up, folks. All you got to do is read the book. In divers places, there will be earthquakes. Let me, let me explain something to you before we go any further. God is not playing hide and go seek with the world. He's not mad at you. He poured his wrath out at Calvary. He, he's not angry with us. He poured every bit of that out on the, on the second person of the Trinity, the rose of, the, of Sharon, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm telling you what he's doing. His mercy is long-suffering, and he's shaking the world trying to say, if I take you out of your ball games, if I take you away from the malls, if I sequester you for a few weeks and get your attention, you've built houses, you've bought land, you got a house at the beach, you got a house in the mountains. You got, a, you got a boat to ride, a camper to, to a run away in. If I just steal for a moment these things that you think are life, could I get your undivided attention to say life does not consist in the abundance of stuff? I, I, I don't believe God calls COVID, but I am convinced it's a mercy of God that is waking the church up to say we are at the bottom of the ninth and it's just about time to go home. And it's not always, I listen to me, beloved, our pastors, not yours, but a lot of our pastors don't even believe this anymore. They don't even have a conviction about it. Much less, they're, going, they're, they're not going to touch it. You can't believe over the last few years the pastors that will call me and say, we'd love to have you come and preach, but number one, you cannot preach the imminent rapture of the church. You cannot bring up Israel because we believe God's done with her. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Whom blesses Israel, God will bless and who curses Israel, God will curse. You better not mess with God's covenant people. So there are a, a, an abundance of signs. And, and I understand we get caught up in the minutia and sometimes we get overwhelmed by what's going on. We, I, I heard not long ago, we had a little boy up in our uh, beautiful mountains of East Tennessee. Uh, he loved John Deere tractors, preacher. I mean, you know who doesn't? I mean, John Deere Green, he just loved John Deere tractors and he was out in the front yard of his little family farm and, and he was playing with his little John Deere tractor toy and he had little implements out there moving dirt and planting corn, you know, pretending. About that time, come down the country lane was the most beautiful, 
brand new, green John Deere tractor. Had the cab on it, pulling a John Deere uh, trailer behind it, big old trailer, you know. He just, he picked his tractor up and picked his combine up, and he was standing at the gate of his, right there in the front yard, and he was looking up wide-eyed in wonderment. But what big old tractor came rolling by with them big yellow double wheels on the back of it. And the farmer saw him, and he thought, I'm going to stop for just a minute and make this little boy's day, and... He governed her down a little bit and opened up that door. And he said, little boy, do you, do you like John Deere tractors? He said, sir, I love John Deere tractors. And, and, and I'm going to have one one day. And he said, Mr. Farmer, where are you going? He said, well, i got a load of manure. I'm, I'm taking over to put on our strawberries. That little boy said, well, you all stay with us. We put ice cream on ours. <laughs> See, it's all in perspective, Amen. Now, 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 not only there's the signs, but I want to talk to you for just a minute uh, about three defining signs. I want you to take your copy of God's Word. Go to 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Pastor's already alluded to this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to touch on it and move out because he's already expositing it to you as a people. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to show you three defining signs that I believe are not only going to prevail, but already. Look at verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. Now, therefore, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Now, now beloved, there are those who will tell you that the word rapture is not in the, in the Bible. And I agree it's not. But neither, neither is the word grandfather. But I, I am going to be one. And I'm going to be one. And he will be the smartest kid born in Tennessee. You understand what I'm saying? The gathering together. I I am convinced in my spirit from Bible, not feeling, not not tradition, because Paul's going to say we are not kept for an hour of wrath, that we don't go through the tribulation. Now, I'm not going to fight anybody over that. And if you want to hang out for it, that's okay. (laughs) I'm all right with that. But I'm out. (laughs) I, I just personally don't believe the bride, it, the tribulation's about the bride. We're not kept for an hour of wrath. That, that's my, in fact, when you get to the book of Revelation, chapter 1 to chapter 4, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, is, is mentioned 19 times. 19 times the ecclesia is mentioned. All the seven churches, Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 4, come up hither. It's a picture of the rapture. Now, the church is not mentioned again, not ecclesia, is never mentioned again. The hagios, the holy ones, because there will be people saved in the tribulation. Two witnesses are going to stand up and they're going to preach, in, uh, they're going to preach like Billy Graham on steroids. You understand what I'm saying? And out of their ministry, according to Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 14, 144,000 male Jewish virgins are going to come up out of that ministry and take the gospel, fulfilling Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 and following, to the ends of the earth. But the church is not mentioned at one time. From Revelation chapter 4, she's never mentioned again, not one time. She's not in the seals, she's not in the trumps, she's not in the vows, she's not in the woes. She's not mentioned again, ecclesia, until Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 and following, where we come back with Christ in the second coming, riding horses. Preacher, do you believe that's a literal horse? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't like horses. I said that wrong. Horses don't like me. They just don't like me. Every time I've ever been on a horse, they take me to the barn and rub me off. Y'all have been rubbed off by a horse? You city folk don't know. We, you've got to be halfway from Tennessee to know what it is to be rubbed off by a mean horse on the side of a barn. You have splinters from your nose to your toes. You understand what I'm saying? I don't like horses. Horses don't like me. My wife does. She said to me, look, we're just going to try it. So she took me and put me on a, on a smaller horse and it scared the mess out of me. If she hadn't unplugged it outside the Walmart, I'd have died right there. You understand what I'm saying? But I do believe we're coming back, preacher, on literal horses. Now, I think mine will be a Shetland. You understand what I'm saying? (laughs) Revelation chapter 19, we come back on horses. We, Jesus steps down, uh, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 14. He steps down on the very piece of property that we just read about. It splits from the north to the, um, from the east to the west, out of that Kedron Valley, off of that Mount of Olives as it splits. 
Holiday Inn about 30 years ago got ready to build the finest resort as tourism took off in Israel. They were going to build a world-class resort on the Mount of Olives, already bought it. And when they were doing the topography and the, ge the geographical studies, a seismis, uh, seism uh, seismologist came in and said, Guys, I can't explain it, but there's a fault right running through your property on the Mount of Olives from the east to the west. All you had to do is read the book. All you had to do is read the book. God's already designed it so that when we step down, it's going to split wide open. Out of it's going to come a river of life. We're going to march down to a place called Petra. We're going to rescue the Jews, bring them back up the valley of Armageddon. 75 days of cleansing and celebration. And in the midst of that time, the bride of Jesus Christ will minister to the Old Testament saints. Now listen, before we get to the good stuff, what's the three prevailing signs? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Verse 3, let no one, there's that word again, deceive you by any means. For that day, that's a general term for the whole activity of, of, of the second coming, the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming. That's a, that's a general term that he picks up from, from Daniel. For that day will not come unless there first, unless there first come a great falling away and the man of sin um, is uh, revealed. Unbelievable deception. I, I'm, I am utterly amazed at what Christians don't know and how to discern biblical teaching. I, I'm amazed at how many people have no clue what's going on right in front of them. Politically, they're being, they're being played because they have no biblical uh, discernment to test the spirits. And listen, I'm going to say something, beloved. This is going to make some of you break out in places you didn't know you had. But the devil is not a comic strip uh, myth he's real and i'm telling you every time a church begins to move in the things of the spirit and win the lost and the saved start getting ready for the coming of the king demonic activity will come in every time to sow seeds of discord and they'll come after that man right there every time you mark it down if they can take him out if they can if they can divide the sheep if they can scatter the sheep if they can divide the body and create confusion they've done all they need to do they've hurt you publicly with your testimony and they've wounded you inside your ministry and that's all they need to do i'm telling you beloved you better stay in this book in these last days now, not only is there a word of deception but but look at verse 3 he said there's a falling away now that term is only used one other time in the book of acts and it has it always without fail it's a doctrinal falling away meaning that it means to replace something that is real with that which is counterfeit you take the you take you take the authentic and you replace it with the synthetic you, listen you've got to teach your children and your children's children how to discern the word of god because the deception not listen it doesn't just stop at deceiving it it, it wants to move them away from the authority of this book. Listen, as, as Southern Baptists, beloved, we fought, pastor's generation fought the good fight to keep this book from being watered down. And, and, and the average church member in this place would say it is the infallible, inerrant word of God. There is no error. I'm telling you, the periods, the commas, and the colons are inspired in this book. Do you understand that? We understand the inerrancy of Scripture, but this is what we've lost. We've lost the authority of Scripture. We don't walk in the sufficiency of Scripture, meaning simply this. I'm telling you about the authority of God's Word. If, if you are up against it, maybe you don't have this problem down here. We've got a problem in East Tennessee of addiction. Now, addiction, according to the Word of God, Gen, uh, Galatians chapter 5, it is actually what the King James calls witchcraft, or if you translate it, it's called pharmakia. Now, if you're a pharmacist, don't get mad at me. I've already insulted the lawyers. Just stay with me for a minute. I, I, I'm not insulting the pharmacist, but the word pharmakia is where we get our word pharmacy. In Galatians chapter 5, the work of the devil, the, the, the works of the devil, one of those is witchcraft. It's called the word pharmakia. This is why our sons and daughters are giving themselves over to every, every form and fashion in the bag and the bottle from, from, from drugs to, to being drunkards. It changes the mind. It, it alters the spirit. The old timers used to say it this way. I'm going to stop by and get me some spirits. Why'd they say it that way? Because it's a false spirit. It's a counterfeit spirit. Yeah. 
and they, listen, they can't deal with life. They can't deal with anxiety. They live in a land we've bought them. Everything that money can buy, they've, had, they've got more than any generation's ever had, and they're worse off than they've ever been. We've got five, six, seven, eight-year-olds on Prozac and anxiety medicine. Now, listen to me. I'm not fussing at you, but I'm telling you this. If you put your kid on medicine before you went to the great physician and asked for the oil of healing, you missed a blessing in this book. When my daughter was di diagnosed with cancer, they said chemo wouldn't kill it, radi radiation wouldn't remove it, and it would be back with a vengeance. Let me explain something to you. We leaned on medical science and we understood it, but medical science was not our last authority. We fasted and prayed and anointed that baby girl, and that my, my daughter that's about to be a mama at 15 was not supposed to live to be 18, and I'm telling you, we got a word from God that we would see her children's children, and that sickness was not unto death. I've been called a charismatic. I've been called an undercover Pentecostal. I've been th threatened to be thrown out of the Baptist and pushed, shipped off to the church of God. Well, let me tell you about this. <laughs> On all of you, because i got a master who can save, who can heal, who can do it. And if you don't think he can, listen, don't tell me that the hope for COVID is a vaccine. You go and take that vaccine. And you grow a third head, I'll talk to you later. Amen. Preacher, sure you going to take that vaccine? Nope. I'm not. I'm not going to take it. <laughs> well, they might let you go out in public. There'll be a lot of people say, whoa! <laughs> Deception, a departure. They just move away. They just move away from the things of faith. Here, here's the last, the last of the it, demonic activity. We already hit on it. Verse 4. I want you to hear this. He who opposes, now he's talking, about, he's talking about the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple. That's a prophetic statement. Listen to me, beloved. The temple is already ready. It, it, it's, it's done. If you go to Israel and you tour with a prophecy teaching guy that will take you over into the temple mount, you ask the temple mount, um, Rabbi Chaim, um, you ask him, when, if, if you got the property today, if you got the temple mound back, how long would it take you to build the temple? And this is what he'll say to you. I've heard, I've heard him say it too many times. He, he will say it like this. It's like your American manufactured homes. We've already cut every, every, we've already cut every piece of material. All of the marble has been cut. All of the beams are cut. And like a Lego house it will take us less than 90 days to put it up. The red heifer has already been sacrificed. She's in her fourth generation. They took her down to Jericho a number of years ago. They began to, there's only three generations of red heifers ever been born in the, in the nation of Israel, only three. And it was, they were, they, they were, the Hebrews will tell you, there was one generation born when the tabernacle came out of Shiloh. There was another generation born when, de, when uh, Solomon dedicated the temple. And there was not one for over 2,800 years. And about 12 years ago, out of nowhere, they found a generation of red heifers that are now temple sanction, sanctioned. And they offered it down at Jericho to teach the young preacher bolt, pa, uh, priest bolt, Boys who are coming home at record rate. One quarter of a million Jews have come home in the last 36 months to Israel. You can't, you can't find a place to live. It is unbelievable. They're waking up all over the world. They're not coming to Christ. They're just doing Ali all. They are running to Israel. They don't even know why. My wife and I were walking down the cobble streets of Jerusalem some years ago. She wanted some ice cream and I walked up to this very Hasidic looking hat wearing curls. Had his talit. He was a very Jewish looking young man beard untrimmed and I said uh, sir uh, my wife would like some ice cream and he said y'all not from here are you <laughs> I said you speak the mother language what are you doing here he said well I grew up in Kentucky my dad's a very successful businessman out of Lexington Kentucky and I was going to take over the business and one night I had a dream, and God said to me, Yahweh said to me, you need to get home, and you need to get home right now. And he left a multi-million dollar business to sell ice cream on the cobble streets of Jerusalem. And I could multiply that story a thousand times because the temple's coming up. Yes, just to, Listen, would you, would you believe that things could have changed this quickly in America? I mean, just like that, we went from <laughs> this... <laughs> It, it, it will take far less time in Israel because the Jews are already going up to the Temple Mount. 
which just two years ago was unheard of. It, it, th th that didn't happen. Everything's in place. Everything's in place. So the signs give way to the shout. So what we're waiting on right now is what I believe to be the next prophetic event inside the church. Now take your copy of God's Word. We're not going to linger long because I, I, I'm, I'm going to get to the conclusion of where we're headed. So I want you to take your copy of God's Word and I want you to make your way over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look very quickly. This is all rehearsing for most of you. But we're building to the final point from signs to shout to summons. Look, if you would, at chapter 5, verse 1. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. That is a Hebrewism. It, when, if you ask a Hebrew, they laugh at us Americans because we don't, we don't study Hebrew documents in a Hebrew understanding. I'm going to tell you some of the, some of the um, most trouble I've been in in a while, <laughs> not saying something, <laughs> is I preached a message um, because uh, I study, uh, I, I was, I, I study uh, at, at the Hebrew University in Israel. Um, I enrolled and I was accepted and I study Hebrew history from the University of Hebrew online. And I, I discovered some years ago what we thought is Joseph was, an, you know, a, a, we call him a carpenter because the King James language calls him a carpenter. And we think he's got a tool belt, you know, a hammer and a skill saw, and he's making beds, <laughs> building cabinets. But the word for Joseph is not carpenter, it's tecton. He was a stonemason. So I was over there studying. I spent uh, about 25 days in the Middle East studying prophecy, working on my degree, and uh, the guy that was teaching me, we went up into Nazareth where Jesus was born, uh, or where Jesus was raised. And we were talking about the temple. Remember Jesus was on the temple mount? That building at that time was, had been under construction 48 years. And it would not be completed for another uh, 33 years, 34 years. I mean, it, 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 the rabbi said this way, if you've not seen the temple, you had not seen a beautiful building. It set up on, 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 on that Temple Mount, and when the sun hit those, those doors that were 18 stories high, 18 stories high, they were laden in gold. And the sun hit it, and it would blind you. It, it was a stunning, unbelievable building made out of white marble that averaged uh, 35 tons apiece. The, the stones did. The, they dug the stones from a quarry in a city called Nazareth. The number one employer in Jesus' stepdad's day was a stone quarry in Nazareth, and Joseph was a master craftsman, stonemason. So when the Bible says he's the rock of ages, when the Bible says he's the chief cornerstone, it is not being cute. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to say, this is the, this, this, he's being very blatant throughout the Word of God. So, what is the shout? Well, go back and look very quickly. He says, as a thief in the night, that's a Hebrewism, when the priest boys would be up on their watch on the Temple Mount, if, if they fell asleep on their watch, the high priest or the priest in charge would take coals from the altar and lay it on their, on their robes. <laughs> okay, I thought that's funny myself, but if they were asleep, they're supposed to be watching. Remember Jesus said, don't, 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 don't be caught sleeping, watch. See, the Hebrews are processing this through Hebrew lesson because the, if the priest in charge, the high priest, came up 3 o'clock in the morning and caught you sleeping as a priest boy, he would just take a coal off the altar and he would slide it up under the end of your robe. <laughs> so the Hebrewism, it's all in Hebrew literature. They would say, don't get caught by the thief in the night because he steals your sleep. It's not the thief we're thinking about. You understand what I'm saying to you? So listen, listen, listen to what he says. For as labor pains 
upon a pregnant woman. That's that language out of, out of, out of the Temple Mount. These are the beginning of sorrows. Jacob's sorrow. That's pregnancy language. If, if there's any ladies in here ever, listen, when the water broke, could you change your mind? When your water broke, could you say, you know, I just ain't going to do this. I've just changed my mind. What's coming? That baby's coming. Listen to me, church. The water's broken. The birth pangs are here. This baby's coming. There is no changing on this thing. Well, watch the flow of the text. For the labor pains of a pregnant woman, and, and they shall not escape. But you, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Amen. Verse 9, uh, verse 11, therefore comfort ye with, with, with these words. Now I want you to listen to me. I'm about to wrap up. There's the signs. That's, that we, we mean touched what's going on in our world today. That's the signs. There's the shout. What's going to happen, preacher? What's going to happen is, is that at the speed of light, we often say at the twinkling of an eye, at the blinking of an eye. That's not what the language means. It does not mean the blinking of an eye. It means, it means 187,000 miles per second, the speed of light. Those who are dead in Christ, from Acts chapter 2 to, to Romans chapter 11, verse 24, the fullness of the Gentiles, the Jews rejected him. They've been blinded. God came over here and chose us that weren't a people to be his people, and we composed something that has never, ever been before. We're the bride of Christ. There will never be another one after we leave. There was never one before Acts chapter 2. You are the bride of Christ. And in that moment, in that rapturous moment, those who were dead in Christ, Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit that sealed us, Literally, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and following, that, that word sealed means engagement ring. We have the earnest of the Holy Spirit of God. At that moment when the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ, that means across this land, every believer that has ever passed in Christ since Acts chapter 2. The last time you saw them, their eyes were clouded with dementia. The last time you saw her, her hair was falling out on the floor from chemo and cancer. The last time you saw him, he was stooped over and he couldn't hardly look up because his bones were brittle. The last time you saw him, you laid him in a crib and he looked fine, but SIDS took him out of nowhere. The last time you saw him, he was playing ball, but in an instant, like a little one, he was gone. But the next time you see him, they will not, my beloved, be sick, stooped, weeping, wailing, sorrowful. You'll never see them like you're going to see them then. You shall be known as you're known, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and you will instantly know them in the spirit. You'll have a resurrection body. You'll have a new name. <laughs> According to the prophets in the Old Testament, we will speak Hebrew. Pastor's name will be Huckin. Instantly you'll know him. Instantly. Now watch this. At that moment, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, according to Romans chapter 14, according to Revelation chapter 19, at that moment, we are translated. We get a new body. We go up to the beam of seat to be examined, not for our salvation, but what we did with our salvation. Because the same grace that saves you is the same grace that endowed you and gave you the ability to do what you couldn't do. So when you're doing what you can't do, somebody will ask you how you're doing what you're doing, and you'll say, it's not me doing it. It's him in me that's doing it. Let me tell you who he is. Are you with me? Now, the average Baptist knows they got saved by grace, but they don't know how to operate by grace because they heard that the grace gifts have something to do with the Holy Spirit, and they knew a guy that one time got out of line with the Holy Spirit, and he was weird. Don't point, ma'am. He was weird. Let me, look at me. He was weird before he got the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was weird before. Brother Jeff, I got a cousin. He just, you know, he got really out of bounds with the Holy Spirit. He's odd. He was, he's your cousin. He's already odd. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, people tell me, Bro, Brother Jeff, if I, if I learn about my spiritual gift and I walk in the Holy Spirit, I mean, I could be like going through Kroger and right in the middle of the produce just speaking tongues. <laughs> no! no! That's not how it works. No. Number one, a fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Amen? Yeah. So you're not going to be in the middle of Walmart and break out in German. Do you, unless there's a German that God wants to win. Now, that's you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Y'all all right tonight, y'all? Looking at me like I got four heads. You, 
You've got to understand that the grace that saved you is now imparted to you an ability, a capacity to do something, a keros in the gift, so that when you go to the Bema, you will be examined not for your salvation, but what you did with your salvation, so that in that moment, you will receive a robe and a crown, you will receive authorities, and over that seven years, we'll be examined. We'll, we will stand before the Bema seat. Some of our works will be consumed in fire. Some of them will be refined, and we, we will come back. At the end of that seven years, when we step down, Revelation chapter 19, on the Mount of Olives, and he routes that enemy back up Armageddon, back up Jezreel Valley. He defeats the enemy at Edom. Who is this that comes with his garments stained with blood? I'll tell you who it is. It's Messiah. And he's going to Petra to get the very wedding party that we, because we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now watch this. Signs, shout, summons. When we step down on that Mount of Olives, and we go to get the bride of Yahweh, there'll be a second resurrection. Abraham's going to get up. Isaac's going to get up. <laughs> Esther's going to get up. Deborah's going to get up. And they're going to come to our wedding. To our wedding supper. This is what they're going to do, Brother Josh. David's going to get up. So there's, there's a mountain that does not exist today that, that will not exist until after the rapture of the second coming of Christ. It's a 50-mile square mountain that will take the place of the Temple Mount today where the Millennial Temple will sit. David is going to walk up to Brother Josh. He's going to say, you're one of them, aren't you? Now, how's he going to know we're one of them? Because we're the bride. We got on marriage clothes. We got a robe on. See, your crown and your robe will be determined at the Bema seat. Some of you are going to show up in a miniskirt. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? He will know you, you have a resurrection body. And they'll be able to look at you, and he's, this is what David's going to say. Brother Josh, I want to ask you something. You're one of them. I mean, I can tell you, you got your crown, you got your wedding garment on. I, I mean, you're part of the bride. You look different than we do. I just want to ask you something. What was it like? I mean, I was a psalmist. I mean, I picked up the, 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 the harp, and I played, and I wrote some pretty good stuff. I mean, I wasn't Bill Gaither, but I wrote some stuff, you know. And, but I could never go into the Holy of Holies. I, I could never stand in the audience of him. I had to stand outside the tabernacle. I had to stand outside the temple. I, I had to have a bull, or I had to have a, 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 a pigeon. I had to have the ashes of a red heifer. I I had to have a, a priest. I had to have somebody to go in. Somebody in this house, tell me, what was it like in the middle of the night to whisper his name and sing the songs of Zion and become the very temple of God? What was it like, living water, when you spoke his name and the place became filled with his glory? You didn't wait in the sun. You didn't wait on Yom Kippur. You didn't wait on the high feast. You just whispered the name that's above every other name, and boom, there he was. Well, I'll tell you, David, we voted on it, but we, it wasn't in the bylaws. It wasn't in the bylaws. Good God in heaven help us. Summonsed. Summonsed. The end of a thousand-year reign. The Bible says that those who've rejected Christ are going to the great white throne judgment. Three times it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 11, following, and they will be judged by their works. And the books were opened. In the Word of God, there's five books. I'm only going to share with you a couple. There's a book of life. The moment that God conceived you in the womb of your mother, before, actually, if you read Jeremiah, your name was written down in the book of life. My Father in heaven already knows the name of my grandchild before it was conceived. At some point, I believe, according to the Word of God, because the Bible says that Christ died for all. I teach my people, in the Greek, all means all, and that's all all ever means. At some point, the Holy Ghost is going to grip the heart of my grandbaby and woo him or her to the cross of Calvary where him or her will have to make a decision to move from the book of life to the Lamb's book of life where the angels rejoice in heaven at the moment that he or she steps from death to life. And if your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, now listen carefully. At the great white throne judgment, you are dismissed into eternal hell. Isaiah said it this way. Hell hath enlarged herself. Why? Why would there be a building program in hell 
Dr. Adrian Rogers said, if you go to hell, you'll be an unwelcomed intruder because you were never meant to go there. It wasn't made for you. He left to go prepare a place for you that I have not seen, ears not heard, and neither is in the heart of man all that he's been. B.R. Lincoln at Liberty University used to tell preacher boys, he said, boys, I want to tell you something. In six days, I want you to look at what God did. In six days, he carved out the mighty Mississippi. In six days, he painted the red on the robin. In six days, he sent a missile into your backyard to suck seven gallons of sugar water called, called the hummingbird. In six days, he told the trees to clap their hands and the grass to be green. In six days, he told the H to get to two, and he made it H2O. In six days, days he made all this what's he been doing for 2,000 years preparing you a place preparing you a place and we sit here tonight with signs on the brink of a shout and we're going to be summons to one of two places whether you're sitting in this house or sitting behind the screen of a computer listen to me hell at enlarged herself you were not meant to go to hell. No, sir. And everything God's doing in these last days is screaming. Lift up your head. Yes. It's just about time to go home. Amen. It's just about time to go home. So that in these last days, with signs around us, a shout before us, and a summons coming to us, Amen. soon and very soon, yes, he is. we're going home. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I pray you take this old feeble preaching and you anoint it in such a way that it will grip our hearts. I pray for the wounded, the weary, the hurt. For those who God have tried all this, and the truth of the matter is they got hurt more at the church than they did at the bar. I pray that this night would be their night and that the Holy Spirit of God would pour fresh oil over their broken, wounded hearts. There are those, God, who have looked at the political, economic, who've looked at the health of our nation and said, God, if you loved us, why in the world are we in this mess? Well, God, we told you to get out of our schools. We told you to get out of our government. We've told you to get out of our country. And this is what we get when we say we don't want God. So tonight, I pray you'd remind some folks in this room and sitting in their own living room that you're a good, good father. And the only reason we've got one more day to get it right is because you're long-suffering. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Brother Josh, in just a moment, is going to begin to minister to us. And I'm begging you in Jesus' name. I, I know we're not necessarily using altars in these COVID days, but I'm begging you in Jesus' name. If you are not right with God tonight, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Not because it's magical or mystical, but because it's just a place of sacrifice. Would you, would you get in an old-fashioned altar and say to God, God, I, I'm living in the days of the signs. I'm listening for a shout. And when I get summonsed, I don't want to appear before you ashamed. If you're here tonight and you're not born again, you're sitting at home watching this message, I'm pleading with you by the blood of the Lamb. Now, this prayer will not save you, but the one you're praying to will. His name's Jesus. You can say something this simple. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I believe Calvary paid it all. You could whisper that prayer right now. A thief on a cross said it this simple. Remember me, Lord. And that day he went to glory. Please don't leave this place. Don't close this service without knowing where you're going in these last days. In the name of Jesus, amen. Pastor's coming. You come, God's calling. Would you stand as uh, Brother Josh ministers to us? Shed. He is able 
he is able, Christ is able still to save. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, sing to him our songs of praise. Come, ye ransomed and forgiven, come, ye rescued from the grave. Rise and worship Christ our Savior. For the glory of his name, he is able, he is able, Christ is able still to save. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, sing to him our songs of praise. In the stillness of the morning and in the quiet of the dawn, praise will rise as darkness scatters and our song goes on. sinners, poor and needy, sing to him our song of praise. He is able, he is able, Christ is able still to save. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, sing to him our song praise. He is able, he is able, Christ is able still to save. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, sing to him our song of praise. If you're watching online, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you'd pray that simple prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know you died for me, and you were buried and rose again on the third day, that I might be saved. If, would you forgive me and give me the gift of eternal life? And if you mean that in your heart, God will save you right there, right at that very moment. And if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, would you contact our church and let us know so that we can give you some materials to help you to grow in your faith? God wants you to grow. And there's things that we can help you with to help you to grow, to be the child of God God wants you to be. We would love to do that. Those of us that are in this room, you remember when you got married, if you've been married, as that day was approaching, you couldn't hardly wait for that day to happen. Especially if you're the guys, you couldn't hardly wait to see that bride walking down the aisle. Or you couldn't, as a bride, couldn't wait to walk down that aisle, see that groom standing at the head of the church. And for that moment to happen, how excited you were. Well, we're fixing to go to a wedding pretty soon. I don't know about you, but I'm getting sort of excited. I'm going to be a bride this time instead of a groom. That's a little odd, but anyway, I can't hardly wait to see the bridegroom. Can you? Mm. Can't hardly wait. Mm. Mm. And I know it's soon. I do. I know. I'm that generation. That's my generation. And I do believe he's coming in my time. I believe he's coming in my day. Even so. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I, my generation will pass from this earth until he comes again. I just believe it. I, I, you know, 
I've preached that and said that and believed that. Preached it not long ago. But I believe he's coming in my time. I don't know the day or the hour, but I do know he's coming. And I'm ready. Aren't you? Got your bags packed? Can't hardly wait. I'm like you, man. When he created, there's some of the most beautiful. I was watching last night. Uh, they, they were showing the beautiful mountains of the Swiss Alps, and the beautiful valleys. It was amazing, gorgeous, beautiful country. I flew over it, but I'd love to just go there and see all that. And how gorgeous that is, so beautiful. It can't compare to what waiting on us. Cannot even compare. No wonder we're going to have to have a new body because these couldn't stand it, could we? Couldn't stand it. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. You say, well, preacher, I've heard that preached before. You just need to be reminded again uh, of what you've got waiting on you if you're a child of God and what you're going to miss if you're not. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for preaching God's word. Amen. I'm going to be, amen. We're going to be taking a trip to Israel next October. Not this October, but next year. COVID is going to be gone by then. And we're going to be going to Israel if Jesus doesn't come back. I want you to go with me. Uh, I really do. Uh, Dr. Tony Crisp, who's going to be with us here pretty soon on Super Monday, is going to be leading that trip with us. And, oh, my Lord, what a teacher. Oh, my Lord, he just makes it come alive. And you don't want to, if you, I will, I'm hoping to have a meeting um, prior to the service when he comes. I'm going to get in touch with him, see if he can't meet. And if you're interested in going, uh, have him meet with us for a little while. And uh, I don't know if we'll have the prices yet uh, because we don't know exactly um, uh, you have to sort of wait about nine months, they say, out before they'll give you any set prices on hotels and, and plane fare. But uh, you've got to go. Oh, you've got to go and experience that. I can't wait to go back. I was there in January and just had a hallelujah time, and I can't wait to go back. Um, but if the Lord tears is coming, You've got to experience that. Start saving your nickels and dimes and go. It'll change your life. You won't ever be the same. You'll never read the Bible the same. Uh, and when they when he's talking about stepping on the Mount of Olives, you can say, I've been there. I, was, I know what he's talking about. You know what's one of the most comical things about going there and standing on the Mount of Olives? Is looking at that eastern gates that the Muslims stopped up, thinking they're going to keep the king of kings from coming in. But one day all he has to do is go, and it'll open up, and he's going to walk right in. Amen? Yeah, it's going to be glorious. Well, it's good to be here tonight. Amen? Tell somebody. Tell somebody else to come. Herb Brevis is going to be here next week, and uh, we love Herb Brevis. And you, you don't want to miss that. But thank you so much for coming. Get your pocketbooks out, all right? I already prepared myself. I stuck it in my pocket here so I wouldn't have a hard time getting it out. And drop it in the buckets. There's buckets here at the back. Let's bless our speaker tonight. Be generous, would you? Uh, usually we always give a good offering. There's not as many people here tonight, so you might have to give a little more. So bless him tonight, would you? But thank you for coming. God bless you. Good night. God bless you.